we have a uh, outstanding panelist Hello. panel with us today. Um, as we kick off the, these sessions, the financial crisis mm -hmm. painfully reminded us how much governance matters. Too many boards, especially in the financial services industry, did not understand how their companies were making money, did not understand what was happening with mortgage-backed securities, and somehow, despite their presence on these boards, did not feel empowered to dig in and ask the tough questions. Since the near collapse of the financial system at that period, there's been a lot of discussion around governance, a lot of talk. What we're here to explore now is, has there been much change in practice, and how is that varied by region? We're going to start with a talk from my distinguished colleague, Ludo van der Heyden, who's the architect of the GBLC this year. Um, Ludo has led for INSEAD the creation of our International Directors Program, certified hundreds of directors since the financial crisis as our contribution to trying to address this. Ludo, if you could kick us off, please. Thanks. First, uh, welcome. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And indeed, there's been a lot of lip service on governance. And typically, now, governance is a new word, uh, meaning whenever there's a problem, people say uh, it's a governance problem. So the EU is in, uh, European Union is in crisis, is because of a governance problem. You know, there was a finance crisis, it was because of bad governance. What we are not uh, exploring enough is actually uh, giving a substance to these words. And in response to uh, Dr. Ali's comments, you know, if before, if you can't convince them, confuse them, I think the world is very uh, confused about, uh, about governance. And I think that's what we're trying to, um, you know, enlighten. I think one of the changes in governance is that we now have directors and board members uh, coming to our courses. And this is very new. Uh, it would be very hard uh, 15 years ago to think of any board member uh, who, would come to a, uh, who would come to a class. And not only do we have uh, board members, but we now have actually uh, graduated you know, more than 600 um, people in the, uh, in the governance course. And we've also, I think, opened a course for owners because you can only have the quality of governance that owners and, and regulators uh, allow. And so owners are coming back to school. And I think this is great news for schools, but I think it's great news for governance too. And uh, go governance is a, is a duality, which is that you always have the other side of the coin from execution. So the difficulty in governance is, is in summary ways, is that you don't do anything. You govern, you make decisions. But, um, the people who do, of course, are, are the executives. And in the US style, the CEO is the chief executive officer. He really should be called the chief non-executive officer because he doesn't execute anything either. So the board is talking to the CEO, the board doesn't execute anything, and the CEO doesn't execute anything. So you're, you're quite removed from the action. And the people who really are the chief executives are, are actually the people in the front line. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, how do you add value um, in governance? And I think that's what we're talk talking about. And I think also, you know, this was very well said by, you know, uh, Your Excellency and also by Dr. Ali, uh, that it's not just the rules. You need rules, but you don't need too many rules. And you're not going to, to change things uh, just, by, just by the rules. So I will make, I have 10 minutes, and Peter, I have my, my meter on, so I will stick to 10 minutes, or you can cut the mic after 10 minutes. I will just make a few comments uh, on governance. Uh, governance comes, of course, from the Greek, gubernao, which is setting the direction. And I think this was well said, which is what's the long-term uh, direction we're going to. The captain of a sailing ship would not actually do in the steering wheel. He would not be on the steering wheel. He would actually say, where are we going? You know, uh, when do we change course? But he would typically not waste his time being on the steering wheel. So the idea that captain is on the steering wheel, that's a, a very American idea that the CEO does everything. 
Um, of course, there are multiple forms of governance. There is economic governance, there is national governance, there is project governance, and then there is corporate governance. But actually, most uh, businesses are not corporations, multi-businesses. Most, most, uh, corporation, most uh, businesses are, sim are single businesses taxi owners, you know, shop owners. And actually the word that doesn't exist is business governance. Everybody talks about corporate governance. Again, because uh, most of the, the, the talk about governance comes from London and the US. And of course, most listed firms on the FTSE or on the, on the, on the New York Exchange uh, are basically corporations, which is multiple, multiple businesses. GE owns 150 businesses, so GE is a corporation. And actually it is the it is the corporate executives of GE who do the governance. The board of GE doesn't do anything. Jack Welch was there for 20 years. And believe me, Jack Welch would not ask advice from the board. He would tell the board what to do. So actually for 20 years, the board of GE you know, didn't do anything until there was a succession problem. And that only arose after you know, Jack Welch had killed so many successors that finally said, no, Jack, it's time to move on. Hmm. Uh, by the way, he was very clever because he moved on and left a mess for his successor, Jeff Melt. Uh, so that was very clever. Now, corporate governance comes from the Latin corpus, which is you're, you're actually a corporation. And uh, I come from Brussels, and if you go to the central place, you have every corporation, the, the gold, the gold uh, workers, the traders, the beer brewers, they all have their house in the Grand Place. So that's the corporation. And um, in the Roman Empire, and the big value of the Roman Empire is that they brought governance, which is that's why so many people joined, because it was safer to exercise business. You could trade. You would be defended by the state, etc., etc. Of course, bad things could happen as well. But people actually enjoyed the governance, the security that came from the Roman Empire. So the corporation is, is like a person, can die, can be sent to jail. And this is very important. It's the directors, the board of directors, even if they don't do anything, who will go to jail because they are responsible. And so that leads us to, to, the, to the duality. Uh, I will first, maybe sort of, I will go here, is that what board of directors do is they frame the mission. And actually they frame, they give a direction, typically medium term. The mission really should come from the owners. So the long term mission, uh, comes actually from the owners. And that's why it's very hard to be on a board of directors if, the, if you don't have owners who give a mission. And I think that's one an advantage of privately held firms uh, is that the owners typically have an idea of where they want to go. So governance is very much framing, putting the frame, and then give autonomy within the frame. And then you give autonomy to the executives to execute. Now the problem is when you give people autonomy, the first thing they will do is jump out of the frame. <laughs> which is they will want to do their thing. To simplify the thing, that's why in the US every CEO is a chairman. Because then when he has an idea, typically he, then he can change the frame because he's a chairman too. And at least he doesn't waste time because he talks to himself. <laughs> uh, there is, I mean, the most amazing thing, talking about confusion, is Jamie Dimon and the CEOs who said, you know, we should introduce good governance in the USA. It just came out, I think it was... Uh, uh, July 16th or something like that. And they all signed Warren Buffett too. And they said the first rule is to separate CEO and chairman. Signed Jamie Dimon, CEO and chairman of JP Morgan. So one of the rules should be consistency. You know, you should actually execute what you talk. Otherwise you keep talking and you're nonsense. So this is where the US is sort of uh, confused uh, about, about governance. Uh, or still confused about governance. So I think reframing Changing the mission is really one of the key roles of, uh, of the boards. Not getting inside, not actually uh, micromanaging and, and, and you know, getting involved. I think that should be uh, left to the CEO. So it's not the owners who fire, if you can use this word, the CEO. It's the board of directors. The owners cannot fire legally because you have in, in many countries you would have a lawsuit. It's actually the board of directors who have to fire the CEO and, of course, not uh, do the job of the CEO. Increasingly, CEOs come from the board, which of course create a conflict of interest because the people who are supposed to coach and help me are going to take my job. That of course opens the mind, if you wish, and favors the, the communication. This was a joke, but it's not, uh, not very good. So contents of governance, mission, naming key officers, control, communication with stakeholders. 
And let me quickly go for the challenges. We'll discuss this. This, I think, is not sufficiently understood. It's the fundamental duality, which is the board of directors report to the owners. But the board of, of, of directors are actually have a fiduciary duty to the corporation. So you have this duality between what is good for the corporation and what is good for, for um, the owners. And I think there is shareholder supremacy, which is the shareholders appoint and fire the board of directors, but the board of directors will go to jail, not the shareholders. By the way, Mr. Diamond said you should pay more attention to shareholders on July 16, 2016, to remind people that board of directors in the US should pay attention to shareholders. So I'm going to be very thing and say, what else? You know, were they drinking or something like that? What were they doing before? It's actually quite remarkable. Um, this is the new view. It's a bit complex, but I think uh, it's basically the stakeholder view. It's also the stateholder view, which is stateholder in terms of ownership by the state. Uh, and it's basically saying that the board of directors in the middle and everybody's interested in governance because governance is power. Okay, so government will be interested. Uh, you know, uh, shareholders are interested, of course. S executives are interested. And the media is interested. And, and uh, in, in the end, who pays for everything? The customers. In the digital economy, people will actually do a, a purchase and they will say, you know, how does my purchase translate into fees for the directors? That will actually add transparency to the whole thing and there will be campaigns against directors from the public. That, I think, is where we're going and in some way that will be a good thing. I will uh, uh, make uh, uh, two sort of uh, quick uh, comments. Or, you know, it's always hard for a faculty member to be quick. Uh, but the Dutch is in these companies. This was probably uh, one of the most uh, biggest companies 400 years ago. Risk pooling, don't invest in a ship, invest in a set of ships because not every ship comes back. 5,000 ship charters, uh, close to a million people sent. They were in this area, they went to India, they went to Indonesia, they were everywhere. They paid an, an annual 18% dividend. That is good. Then they became VOC, in Dutch this means United in Corruption. Insider trading by directors. I only invest in the ships that return. <laughs> and it's the public that invest in the ships that don't return. Uh, excess dividends due to double bookkeeping. Well, even in Amsterdam, PWC or whatever was still at work. So let's go to Indonesia, Jakarta, which was called Batavia. Their PWC office is more amenable. Then they manipulated the sugar prices. The Chinese were, went very upset. They killed the Chinese. And it ended in a, government bailout, in a government bailout. You remember when General Motors became government motors? That's really when government started. <laughs> uh, this was an early warning about greed is good. Some of my colleagues actually say this is true. This is a painting from uh, 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 an Antwerp painting. Notice virtue, that's the lady. The man is, is actually avarice, you know, is that he looks at the coins. And of course, she's seduced by the coins as well. Now, did the world learn from this? The answer is not at all. Uh, the British did worse in terms of a disaster, which is, it isn't just that Jakarta went up to flames. The whole Indian government, uh, the whole Indian continent went up to flame. This was the Indian rebellion. And that's when actually uh, India became nationalized from the British East Indies companies. And that was not a government allowed. So the British didn't learn anything from the Dutch. We did not learn anything from this. So 400 years later, this is the, what I'm trying to say is the Dutch East Indies companies is a very current story. And so now you can look at Enron, you can look at, uh, you know, uh, Madoff, you can look at sort of other things, you can look at insider trading, McKinsey, Goldman Sachs, you know. These are big names. This is virtue. And, and how come people do this? So you said, well, in 2001 to 2010, we saw the World Series of Fraud. We got it. We're now going to be clean. What happened since? Das Auto, Volkswagen. You know, uh, we're going to uh, conquer the world and, and with clean cars. And it's the government of California which actually wanted to promote Volkswagen to tell the Americans, buy more Volkswagen. Fortunately, they didn't, so they only sold 500,000 cars because Americans didn't want to go on diesel. Uh, Wells Fargo. How could this be possible? New strategy, cross-selling. 
which is basically, this is interesting, the board approved cross-selling. Now, if I go to a bank, is my first wish to have cross-selling? And the answer is, of course not. I just want to have service on the thing I want, not cross-selling. You know? And so, basically, where was the board? Uh, you know, it's very uh, clear. This is a little joke, you know, uh, where are we now? You manipulated, you lied to, you know, you profited it. And then somebody says, you know, well, people are now learning about finance, which is just moving money from one pocket to the next one. Big challenge, illusions. We see the world as we are, not as it is. I'm Flemish. I see the Walloons and the French as a Flemish guy, not as the French and the Walloons are. The Walloons look at me as a Flemish guy. So actually, my, in, my INSEAD colleagues look at me as very strange because I'm French-speaking and Flemish. This should not supposed to happen. And because they don't understand it. So this is very, very important. Anais Nin also said, some people never awaken, which is they, they remain delusional. And um, I will sort of say uh, delusion you know, is basically the big danger is you think you know when you don't. The problem is not with people who don't know. The problem is with people who think they know when they don't. And I will finish with um, a final comment, the complexity of governance. I will leave comments on the US and Europe and Asia to the panel. And, and uh, I also have Pekka and the co colleagues who can do this. But let me uh, finish with an interesting story. And I know one of the panelists is in the automobile industry as an investor. Is the UK has never produced more cars than today. Now, if you talk to the English, who has the best governance model? The answer is we, the English. English have something very special, which is mixed boards. So you have both executive directors and non-executive directors. So now, if you look at the UK automobile industry, all of the companies are producing cars under foreign ownership. Jaguar Tata, Bentley Volkswagen, Peugeot, etc. All, 100%. Maybe Morgan, you know, sort of who sells 10 cars a year. Maybe they're not under foreign ownership. But basically all of them. Now, that's an interesting question, which is, is the best governance model better because you have foreign owners? And believe me, German owners try to govern the British firms, and they say, the Brits are impossible. <laughs> you know? So they move back. This was actually good because they let the, the firms run by, by Brits. Uh, is the UK governance a great model? Or maybe it's just that the English are flexible and they say, you know, there's not much money to be made in automobiles, so let the foreigners own it. So some people say the British are very smart because there's not that much to be. But this is a simple question, which is a landslide. All the ownership went to the foreigners. Uh, they've, they've been highly performing, so these were good ideas. Uh, but what's the role of governance is this? And this is one of the things we might elaborate on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rudolf. <clears throat> All right, we'll turn quickly to the panel. I, I think the, the question for you is either to react to some of what you heard from Ludo and to dig in in terms of what are, as Ludo says, poor governance seems to be an enduring problem in, in the world. What are one or two areas where you think we can be making progress, where you potentially see progress? Um, I'm going to start with uh, Mahmoud al um, al Khoji, the Chief Executive Officer of Muntalak, which is the Bahrain Sovereign Wealth Fund. So we're going to start with a view of an investor. Um, how do you see governance evolving? Well, I think governance is a very encouraging framework for investors. Wherever we look at investment anywhere, you know, if there is proper governance, we get a lot of comfort about it because we know what are, how the business is running, what are the rules of the business. You know, and sometimes we make investment, I think you alluded to it, and we go there and we are coming from the Gulf, uh, we're classified third world country, we make investment in European companies. A lot of time we are shocked that government does not exist there. And we had to implement what we've been taught to do. It. And I think you alluded to that without naming anyone. But let me come back to the region and let me share with you few experience we have here. I think in, in, we've been very, very much believing in governance in Montelica, we believe in transparency, we've been working very closely with the, the NCR Institute to really implement it. But the shocking thing that I found out is, and let me use an example of GCC. We are six countries, we have six governors for each country. To me that doesn't make sense. 
if you have a machine, you have one operating manual. If everybody has a different operating manual, I can understand we have a different language, but different operating manual for each country, that tells me people are not embracing governance, they are changing the rule to suit their own bad habits. And the second thing I think in the region is, I've, I've noticed that the public sector are way ahead of the private sector. With a very few shiny examples, I mean, I think one city here, the Khan Group, public sector are way ahead from the private sector. The private sector is really lacking in governance, and they do not have that one. And the dilemma comes in is that once we set the governance, we take our most of our directors from the private sector because they have the best practices. And once we bring them into our industries, you know, they look at us and say, look, I run my own business. How, you are telling me how to run the business. Oh no, I know it better than you. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of challenges of really putting governance in here. But I think, you know, all of these shocks that happened really showed that it is very, very important. For us, if we go places that there is no governance, there is no investment. If there is no transparency, period. We have made up our mind that, you know, these are fundamental for our way of working, way of doing business. I think that's a, almost the, only, the biggest security that we get when we know that you're able to do that one. And I think the region have been doing a lot, but I think we need to do even more. For us, as a culture change, we have to put in. I mean, I mentioned it, I'm not too shy about it, but that's why the kind of group have been going for more than a century. Because you have embraced it, and it is there. And I know it very well that it is, yeah, but really, I think we need, we have a lot of private sector here that have been going for one generation, second generation. If you want to continue, really embrace the two governance and adhere to it and respect it. Thank you. Um, so why don't we go now to a sort of investor and operator perspective. So as you're alluding to, Michel Hamed Kanu, chairman of the Kanu Group, um, an astute observer of the world and often outspoken. What, what are your thoughts uh, for us today? Uh, I'd like to start with something uncontroversial, but I can't. <laughs> um, the, the, the main problem, with, the issue with governance is we like to dance around the subject rather than talk about the subject. The subject is, in, in, in effect, an uh, issue of control. Um, who controls what? And if you want to understand control, you have to understand human nature. And human nature works around two levers. One, the first lever is greed, and the other one is fear. If you can understand these things, then you will understand why people will resist giving up control, and by allowing proper governance, you are actually doing that. You're giving up control. By giving up control, you are causing a certain amount of people to fear what are they going to discover about us. The, the idea of having a board of directors is, uh, in this part of the world, um, we, are very, we are very, and I, uh, I'm, I'm trying to be as nice as possible, but unfortunately, uh, we're very tribal. And tribal means there's a leader, and everyone else there is there to help that leader move along to a certain point. But if people's natural uh, tendency is, I want to know what does the leader want, and I will give him, or her, most likely it's him, uh, what he wants. But that defeats the whole purpose. The idea of a governance is I'm here to say that's wrong. If this is not right, it's wrong. But because this fear factor is there, and then you add the greed factor. The greed factor is I'm on the board of directors, I'm getting remunerated. If I don't give the leader exactly what he or she wants, I'm going to be off the board. And so therefore, there's a fear and greed factor pushing that. I'm going to be as um, flexible as the leader wants. Um, and uh, I, I wish this was just, just in our part of the world. It's in, uh, it's in all, all the world. The difference is the way it's shown. The transparency aspect of it becomes an issue. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't overcome it by finding out the right ways of helping people understand. Your job is to help me do better for not only the shareholders, but also the employees within the company, or if I'm a, if I'm a government entity, w within the whole community. But that has, uh, as uh, Dr. Luke mentioned in the beginning, that has to come from the leadership. Uh, we have a lovely saying in Arabic, um, the fish doesn't stink from its tail. If the leadership is not going to help by creating an open environment, by creating a, an, a, a, an area where there's, there's safety, where you can come and say things that I need to hear as a leader to move me in the direction that benefits us all without having to fear I'm going to have to give up something, then it's never, you're never going to have governorship which is worth anything 
other than a nice little tag to say, yes, in my company I have a board of directors, yes, we have governance, and yes, we have transparency. But if that's what you want, that's what you're going to get. If you want to have an effective change, you're going to have to create that environment that says, come in, talk to me, tell me, and even if I don't like what you have to say, tell me it. And it's not going to cost you. If we can create that, you will have the governance structure that you will allow the company, and, and perhaps in the um, government sector, the environment that you need to move things forward. Thank you. All right. All right. A, a third, as Ludo says, it's about multiple stakeholders. Clearly, if we're going to move these systems, it takes leadership. It also takes leadership from the government. So we have uh, Dr. Anand Sufi, uh, founder of DAS Partners, but up until recently, former commissioner at the Capital Market Authority in Saudi Arabia. Um, what's your view on uh, governance and, and how we can move practice forward? Uh, we think uh, governance is something that is newly evolving and will continue to evolve. Uh, different schools of thoughts, uh, there is no way to say this is the, the dominant trend, uh, let's go uh, for that. Uh, so investors along with regulators, along with operators, along with customers must be engaged. So the stakeholder approach of, of governance uh, is most likely to dominate. Uh, I have learned a lot uh, from the, uh, when I was, when I landed in the Capital Market Authority, uh, to me it was, you know, how does the regulators look at uh, corporate governance? First of all, I had to resign from all my board memberships. <laughs> uh, and as an investor, I was looking at it from an investor point of view. Uh, regulators, uh, they cannot dictate, they, they create the rules for governance. Uh, there are other regulators as well, so the core regulation of, of the governance system uh, becomes important. Uh, the perspective is really, you know, who is, if things go wrong, who is, you know, what is, who do you hold accountable? The company itself or the board. How can you hold the board accountable if things go wrong? Like in the Wells Fargo uh, case, uh, who is accountable? Uh, are there in the rules, what are in the rules that clarify that the accountability is uh, in the board? And is it the chairman or is it the CEO or is it the independent directors? How can independent directors be comfortable that we, we have a sustainable uh, model. Uh, so there, we are in a state where there are, there are more questions than answers. Uh, the most, uh, you know, so for a board member, he needs to know, of course, he has to own the strategy. He, own, he, he owns, the, he understands the mission. They understand the role very clearly, as if it's a KPI, like the KPI of the board. And it's different from the executive's uh, role. Uh, that's what I look at it right now. And uh, if the strategy is clear, as things go along, what is, how can he assess the performance? And then uh, the question becomes, uh, are we performing well or not? Is the company performing well or not? Because he has a fiduciary responsibility. And then, Culture, the issue of culture. Who sets the tone? Who influences the culture? How can you assess the culture of the organization? Because culture drives strategy. Uh, no matter what strategy you have, the culture is the one. That the so to what extent are board members, independent board members, involved and understand the... So to me, it's like the tip of the iceberg. What, what a board can see is really the tip of the iceberg, unless if there are tools and processes where they can understand uh, and assess the, uh, the culture of an organization. Uh, in conclusion, I say it's a learning process. It is still, I mean, we're going to see more and more 
clarity on roles of boards and the governance framework. But I like uh, Ludo's uh, framework, uh, the fair uh, leadership uh, process. Uh, there, you know, I believe also there is a fair uh, governance process. Uh, too much governance undermines leadership. Too much leadership is good, but it has to be consistent with good governance. So having good governance and good leadership is a, is a great thing. Stakeholder effectiveness is also an important measure uh, where the stakeholders are active, they're involved, they're engaged, and they determine the vision, the mission of the, of the company uh, or of, a, of the public sector uh, organization or of a small, of a small company. Uh, so in conclusion, I think uh, regulators, uh, they are also in a learning phase. They try to do the best they can. They try to ensure that the rules they make uh, create the value necessary for society. Very good, thank you. Clearly complicated enough managing governance from within, but then trying to somehow steer that, that system yes. is, is very good. I'm gonna come back a little bit later and just ask where you guys look for inspiration when you, you, when you look out there and, and think about where are the models that, that we, can, we can draw on. But first, I'd like to hear from Pekka Hetla, a professor of finance, chair of the INSEAD finance area, who's recently, um, in September, moved to the Abu Dhabi campus. Um, what are your views? Also, Ludo said some pretty provocative things about governance in the US. I'm wondering um, what, what, what your views are. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I feel like, uh, let me first kind of say that, yes, I'm here a finance professor, and I will mainly bring some, uh, some data from, uh, from academics. But uh, I'm also a former, uh, former uh, member of uh, directors in a, in, a, in a bank. So Ludo's words, of course, hurt me especially a lot. Uh, and, and I'm an investor, so uh, I was very happy to hear my words uh, saying, uh, saying that uh, if there is no good governance, there are no investments. And I, I would like to start with that point of view, that uh, we need corporate governance Board of directors are between owners and managers of the company. And I, I think that's a kind of a key starting point. And, and like Mahmoud said, if there is no good board of directors, there's no reason why investors will invest in that company. And, uh, and uh, in, in terms of that one, I think, I think there is a big, big, uh, big change happening. Uh, we have a data in academia, let's say, last 30 years. And I think the leader of good corporate governance has always been, and I believe today, is still uh, United States of America. There is, there, is no, there is no doubt about that one. Because I believe that the board of directors, the main goal is to ensure that the managers, the top management of the firm, is, uh, is leading the firm to create as much value as a uh, firm uh, can create, uh, to be the best the firm can be. There is, uh, there is no excuse for leading the firm and uh, not being the best you can be. And, uh, and the data on that one, in 1980s, in the U.S., uh, the average uh, board accepted its CEO to underperform four years before the CEO was uh, asked to leave and replaced by a better CEO. At that same time period, 1980s, the number in, uh, in Europe and Asia, I don't have the data from, uh, from this, uh, this region, was eight years. And, and this is unacceptable. As a board member myself, uh, I, I could not imagine accepting uh, top management, uh, which is showing eight years of underperformance before uh, top, uh, top management is, uh, is asked to leave. And we have a sad example, uh, which is in the press all the time, Deutsche Bank. We had, uh, even in 2000s, we had a CEO, uh, which the board kept as the leader of Deutsche Bank for 10 years, and every single year, the owners we're suffering. I do not know what, I believe it was a Qatar fund, which is now a big shareholder. I don't know what they, what was behind their thinking of investing massive amount of money to Deutsche Bank when they had a 10 years, the Deutsche Bank was the performing below average bank in the world before the board asked uh, Joe Ackerman to leave. And I, I feel bad for John Cryan, who is now trying to turn around this company, that, uh, because maybe it's, maybe it's too late. When, when we have a 10 years of a bad CEO, it's not easy for, uh, for the new guy to come and try to uh, save the culture of the, 
of the, of the bank. Uh, today these uh, numbers, on average, maybe not yet in Germany because there's a couple of other German examples, but on average now the numbers are actually four years in Asia, in Europe, in the US. So I think uh, regions are learning from the best practice. The, the ports are getting closer to the best practice in the world. Uh, we don't anymore in the board of directors. We, we hear what Mahmoud is saying. Uh, if, if you don't do this one, you don't get money. You don't get investment. So I think we are moving towards better, better structure in, uh, in all the regions. But I believe that still the U.S. is a profit right. leader. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'm going to take... You want to, Mahmoud, you want to I'd like, I'd like to just make one comment, you know, to be pleased, Mushan. I think, you know, what we have here is we have a culture at running organization. And the dilemma there is we are putting corporate governance to correct cultures. I don't prescribe that culture should adjust corporate governance. Corporate governance was, was put up to really correct the way we are doing wrong things. And if we go there and we say, no, this is the way we are doing it, change the rule, we might as well not have the rule. It's what we need to have discipline. We need to have, we need to change. I don't think culture should change rules and regulation and corporate governance should be the other way around. And it's a very hard task, I know. People, especially when you talk to very successful private sector people, who are we telling you you're doing it wrong? That is fundamental, you know, they have to change. Uh, may I? Yes, please. Please. Um, I don't think what you call we should change the culture per se. It's an, it's an adjustment in understanding how our culture works and to work within that. I'll give you a case, a case in point. Um, we like to think of um, uh, the European, again, please forgive me, I'm not trying to pick on anyone here, but um, the European mindset in terms of it has to be organized in a certain manner. And so therefore, this is the way it works. We've been doing uh, corporate governance since forever. The tribal mentality is exactly that, uh, shura, right? Where we sit down, there will be a, a gathering of people, there's a head of the shura, and they will be sitting and talking to one another. And you want two life examples. Um, uh, one is uh, historic, and I'm not trying to preach religion here, but one is historic, which is Rasul Ali And the other one, which is a live example for us here, uh, which is why we're sitting in this place, it is literally uh, Sheikh Zayed, Allah Rahman. Forty years ago, forty years, years ago, sitting there in a, really, in a desert, thinking I'm going to create something of significance. Now, this doesn't happen because one person is doing it, but because there are certain people sitting and talking with it. He didn't change the culture, but he's bringing ideas into a culture and taking it from there and bringing it to fruition. Now, again, if you don't have the right people with you, and you don't have the right, uh, an open environment, it's never going to happen. And that's the thing I'm talking about. I'm, again, I'm not an idea of changing culture, but understanding how to take that governance and putting it within the cultural frame, but mm -hmm. giving it the space to breathe. He beat me because he used two examples I cannot argue against. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go to the audience in, in a few minutes to get your questions, but I, I want to probe. So you, you, know, you talk about somehow you know, these different regions. You bring up European examples and, and more stakeholder-oriented. Sometimes people see you know, a, a contrast between a more stakeholder view and say the, the, the US very shareholder driven view. Is, do you see differences in approach and governance there? Do you have preferences, views on how we, we reconcile the two? Anyone wanna? Uh, shareholder view versus stakeholder yeah. view. Well, it usually starts with a shareholder view. And then the, the when you hire people and you reward them and they say you have to get customers okay so then the customer become the boss to so the front people the boss becomes very important and that communication uh, evolve eventually goes to the board and they say well board will say okay then you need to make the customers happy and uh, so they become an important stakeholder uh, and then you have these indices you know preferred places to work for and uh, uh, so eventually you have to have some elements of stakeholders uh, assessment stakeholder uh, invo you know perspective on the governance and the you know the UN you know the principles of responsible investors PRI uh, stresses the the importance of governance and stakeholder uh, views of course shareholders will always be dominant but 
uh, you cannot be at the you know at the cost of the customer or at the cost of the employees or at the cost of society uh, but successful you know you know lessons learned is that successful company sustainable company always take into account all the stakeholders and uh, that's a key element what makes them sustainable not not a, not a big Contrast. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there's no contradiction between these yeah. terms. So uh, a shareholder view just means that as a board of director, I have to remind my managers that the ultimate goal has to be that my investors get uh, their returns. But how do they get the returns? There's clear evidence. Happy employees create more shareholder value than unhappy employees. Uh, happy customers create more shareholder value than unhappy. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, there's, uh, there's no contradiction in this. Yeah. What did you want to? Yes, I, I think I just want to add uh, my comment on the Dutch East Indies companies is that there's been a lot of progress in, in business management and even in leadership. And I would say there hasn't been that much progress in governance. If anything, maybe we've gone back, you know. Uh, so I think that's the view that it's still an emerging uh, field and it's a great field for uh, academics because people have strong beliefs but there isn't a science you know it's good to have strong beliefs if there is a science to back it up but the worst thing is strong beliefs and being relatively clueless you know so that's very dangerous and i think that's a bit uh, the view uh, of governance and i i've been sort of uh, teaching and directing the advanced management program for many years and i asked the senior managers you know do you know your governance system in the company the answer is no why should you have it well, that's a good question. Uh, what's the benefit to you? Uh, it's a legal obligation. No, no. Good governance ensures that your boss will be better than the one you have with bad governance. Because as, as Pekka says, you have a discipline. But the real ambition of governance is not that you have to fire the CEO is that you have the best CEO that you can have. So in that sense, you know, people say you have to turn over CEOs. Well, my view is there is no right or wrong. You know, if, if you have a, a guy like Warren Buffett, why would you say, you know, two terms and you go? But if there is a good governance system, I'm more confident about the decision to keep him. But very often, the U.S. view is market discipline. There is no question, I agree with Pekka, market discipline is the highest in the U.S. But in a certain way, and part of the issue is, that's why we want to have transparency in markets, because... Uh, if we have transparency, share price goes down, and if share price goes down, private equity takes over, we can, and the first thing we do is we change the board and we change the CEO. But the purpose, the positive purpose of governance is that we don't have to fire the CEO and that the share price doesn't go down. So, so that's, that's, I think, is, is really, and there is a, a, a view, which is, uh, do you want to go for short-term you know, uh, hits, or do you want to be more sustainable, perhaps slower? And in that sense, many shareholders say, you know, well, future is the future. Give me dividends now because I don't trust the long term. So that's the ownership uh, board relationship. And, and I think that cannot be stressed enough. And <clears throat> the market is a fiction. There is no such thing as the shareholder. I've worked with a lot of family firms. They have four branches. And when you have four branches, you have four different views. And then the board members becomes a negotiation between the branches, which is an ownership problem, which is not a, a, a director's problem. So, so basically, uh, the key issue in governance is which shareholders are you working for? Which are the best shareholders for your project? And that's sort of a, a, a give and take. And in that sense, you have share, shareholder supremacy. But let's not kid ourselves. I have seen shareholders destroy companies, you know, because they just were relatively clueless and they had strong beliefs and wrong and the others were following along and that is not a local tribal issue that's a tribal issue in every family firm in Europe etc and my final comment is I wish there was European governance here but in Europe every country has different governance issues and there I join Mahmoud which is it would be nice that we had European rules this will maybe be easier after Brexit uh, because it's very hard to have rules that the, that the English would agree with. And uh, then we would have a European governance. And, and that would be very good because now capital could flow freely and, and there would be more transparency. 
Um, I promised some questions. Why don't we, what well, I suggest, why don't we take three questions from the floor. If you could briefly, really briefly introduce yourself and briefly ask one succinct question. Please, the gentleman in the center. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum, Muhammad Harun, MD, uh, your compass in Abu Dhabi. Uh, very intriguing uh, uh, panelists, thank you very much. Uh, a quick question. Uh, it seems uh, the world pays attention to governance uh, when things goes wrong. Uh, if things are you know, going well, stocks markets are up, uh, we rarely hear about it. And he is a smart CEO until he's caught, and then he's a crook. Is it a time for governance to, to, uh, to reinvent itself and base itself on ethics? And uh, what's the role that the business and academia can have in this? Thank you. Very nice. Okay. Reinvent itself around ethics. Is that the... Good. Um, another question. I'm um, right here. Hi, my name is Ashad Said, and I'm working for Adi Salat. <clears throat> uh, I'll, I'll connect a couple of dots from the uh, speeches from each of the speakers. For example, Mr. Mahmoud said that the public uh, uh, sector is more advanced in terms of governance, and then Mr. Michal said that you know there, there's a factor of fear and greed, which is uh, which is there in a human. So if if we talk about uh, the involvement of public sector in the board of directors to balance the, the overall uh, the, uh, you know, the, the setting in terms of uh, you know, the, the valuing this, the impact on the society as well as the return on this to the shareholders. And uh, obviously the, the, the bigger question, I don't know if uh, that uh, could be answered, is the comparison of the capitalist system versus any social system uh, for, the, for the governance. Yep. Okay, so there's clearly, again, around reinventing governance, there is certain pressures out there to bring a stronger public sector voice somehow in, um, which is, I think, quite controversial. Uh, yes, one more question, and then we'll go to the panel for some responses. Good morning. My name is Mahesh Sharad Puri. I founded uh, an outsourcing company. We employ about 4,000 people here now uh, in IT, retail, in many sectors. Um, the company is eight years old and it's uh, of a certain size now that I'm compiling a board, um, more of a non-executive director board. Do you have any statistics in terms of um, do revenues or profits actually go up? Uh, is there any proof, any studies uh, when a board like this is constituted, especially for perhaps smaller or mid-sized businesses that have been started by entrepreneurs like us? Thank you. All right, great. We have a, a rich range of questions. Um, anyone want to jump in on, on one of these? Yes. Can I uh, just ask a question regarding, the first question was regarding ethics. Mm. Uh, whose ethics? So, uh, this, is a, this is a dilemma. Um, if, I'm, um, uh, if you imagine a board made up of people from different nation nationalities and different cultures, whose ethics do I apply? Whose morality do I apply? This is a hard, very hard question. If you're talking about a homogenous body, well, it's much easier. Uh, especially, if, let's say, if it's a family, it becomes really easy because you all understand and all talk a single language. But if you're talking about a, a multicultural company with different board members from different countries, with different um, ethics, uh, um, cultural background, how do you take up on the ethics issue? It's a very hard thing. May I also answer? Yes. I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to. Uh, no, no, uh, no it's, kick uh, off. it's good. Take mm -hmm. all the time. May I also answer the question, the, the question that you mentioned as a, as a young question? I would be less worried about setting up a board because you haven't reached a plateau. I'd be more worried about creating value for yourself and your employee and your company. Once you do do that, you, uh, it's, uh, imagine a bell curve. Um, you, the, the, all companies go through this. Uh, you're, you're starting the company, so the company is starting towards the uh, top. When you hit the plateau, then you want a bit of governance to allow you to stretch this out. But until then, uh, you need someone who's driving it, and I wouldn't want to put too much shackles around you because that's what a governor. A gov sorry, I, I know this sounds controversial <laughs> here again. But as an entrepreneur, uh, it's very hard to transition from most. By the way, it's one of the reasons most companies fail. Uh, sorry, fail to go from a uh, uh, entrepreneurship mindset into a corporate mindset because you have two different mindsets. If you're trying to focus on one where you're still in the in a, sorry, in second stage, where you're still in the first stage, you're going to fail. So don't worry too much about the other one, but prepare yourself. Preparing yourself is, I think, the right way. Preparing yourself, I don't mean by saying what you call, eh, we'll do it in the future. No, no. 
prepare yourself by putting up the guidelines, the structure and idea. Slowly pick and choose the right people who you think would fit the governance structure that you want and move towards that. Again, this is just my opinion. Very good. Thank you. Well, I think I go to Ludwig's earliest point is you need to walk the talk. You need to believe in corporate governance. Otherwise, it's not just a slogan in the world or something. Really, when we in Mantelaka tried to do that, when we thought about it, we said, the poor manager, the poor chief executive believe in it, but he has a board that are hammering him down. And we started on a program, it's a longer program, to train the board, the directors. And really, it was not just telling them these are corporate governance. We were teaching them and telling them, with the help of NCI, these are your rules and regulations. These are the management powers. Don't interfere in the management. Let this to the management. You need to start the board and tell them, look, these are your rules and responsibility. You are the god of the company, you can make all the rules, but it's better to let management have their space, do these things. Then there will be accountability. I think we, you, know, you need to start the top and bring it down. You need to believe in it, otherwise it will not work out. It is very important that people adhere to it, to the top. If I understand, I'm sorry, in, in response to the, the, the first part of the question, you're saying, if you actually put into practice good, good governance, you will actually proactively avoid these kind of problems. It's not that we have to disrupt and revolutionize no. governance, we actually just have to do it. Exactly. Um, anyway. And people have to see the benefit. All right. And people have to see it as a leadership. You know, let me give you another example. I know, as a CEO of the company, if I like something, everybody around me will say yes. If I don't like it, they try to be nice to me. Mm -hmm. So what I did is in our committee's rule, I said two things. If we have a topic we're going to discuss, nobody's allowed to discuss it with me one to one. Secondly, nobody is allowed to lobby and talk about it in the other. I want everybody to come to a meeting with his own fresh mind. Because a lot of time you go to a board meeting, the decision is already made. People have lobbied in that one. There is no real discussion. It's very important to have that fresh discussion, to listen to everybody. And for the leader of the companies, I tell them, relax a little bit and let the people make discussion. A lot of time it will go your way. You don't need to dictate it. If it's right, it will go your way. It is very important to have that. Any other responses to the first question? I think uh, in the ethics, uh, usually uh, in most uh, regulations try to capture as much as possible in the compliance, you know, the practice and the, and, and the ethics. They try to capture it and they evolve. So whatever ethics that are relevant to the business and to the regulator, they try to capture it. Uh, I wouldn't say it's 100 percent perfect. It's a learning process. There is a feedback uh, always with the institutions that uh, you know, mm. you know, they comply, and uh, sometimes there are complaints and listening, and uh, so it's 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 an evolution. But in in the, in the end, it's really, I think, culture drives performance. Leaders create the culture. And culture drives performance and drives the strategy. I echo what uh, Mahmoud is saying that, uh, you know, for a lot of institutional investors, the first thing, you know, I used to look at is the same, is really governance and the culture. If the governance is good, then we invest. If the governance, I mean, you can, you can diagnose the, cur the, the governance by, by sensing and talking with the, with the, uh, with the people. And they, they have to display something that makes the investor comfortable. For private firms, I think they can set the rules as long as they don't violate uh, the rules, and uh, they can create their own, you know, their culture. Uh, they could, uh, you know, uh, and some of them have very good cultures. Uh, they are private firms; they're owned by a by a family, and they are also sustainable. So there are we have seen successes and failures in all in all aspects. Um, what do you do, and well, this is an open question now, but what do you do in a, a situation where um, rules and regulations, um, which we think and perceive as the right way of doing things, clashes with culture? I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. In our part of the world, and, and I will say in the majority of the world, the idea of gift giving, the question is whether it becomes bribery or it's really a gift. In certain cultures, the idea is I give a gift, not necessarily to aim, gain favor, but this is my way of paying respect to person X. This is a person who's in less status, and I have to pay them that respect. 
Now, if I want to do that, and I'm taking my culture, and I'm applying it to somewhere else where the culture doesn't allow that because it's looked upon as bribery, how do I play that? Because that's an issue of governance. Because if I use the European mi mindset, uh, which is eventually moved into North America as well, after a certain value, and, and this, the value is arbitrary, after a certain value, it becomes an issue of bribery. Or you have a compliance, uh, sorry, a, a governance body that has to look into see whether it was bribery or not. The question is, I'm going to meet a ruler of a country. I'm going to meet a ruler of a, of a company, which is, in some cases, bigger than countries. I can think of a few at this point. And I'm going to go empty-handed. Culturally, I feel wrong. This is wrong. I should be giving him or her something. Not necessarily because I'm bribing them because I want something from them, but because this is our way of teaching. Sorry, uh, we were taught this is the way we respect the other person, not the person per se, but the, uh, the status of the office. I need to do that. How do we balance the two, keeping in mind an issue of governance and the issue of perceived bribery? And again, for me, this is a question mark. No, I just, uh, occurs to me is that uh, as you talk about a lot of the way governance is lived, you know, dealing with the emotions, interacting with culture, clearly it needs to be adapted to, to, to some extent to, to the locations. Um, let's, let's, maybe we'll take uh, two more questions uh, from the audience, and um, while we're doing that, if anyone wants to respond to this issue of how we adapt governance to local culture, we'd be interested in that as well. well there's no, no uh, question that having a strong culture to begin with helps the board. So if you bring in people from different cultures, you're going to have to manage the culture, and I think that would be my message is, the first thing is you have to manage the culture of the board. So you have to have rules of the game, part of that. So do we give to each other? Not if we get a gift, is it a gift to the corporation? Whatever, you know. But we have to have we have to manage culture, and and that is something that most boards don't do because it's extremely difficult uh, to manage culture, especially if you meet four times a year. There is no chance in hell to even understand what you're talking about. So this, I think, will, will be increasingly important in the new digital world, because from our digital survey, we got the view that the biggest problem with digital is not the technology, but is the culture of the senior leadership, and perhaps also of the board. So you need to actually change the culture of the board to be more digital so they can make the right choices. And I think that's, uh, that's where a corporate owner, I think, uh, rings the bell and sort of says, you know, time to uh, get the asset, uh, the boards of our asset companies in shape to make the right decision. And in addition, we have a chief digital officer who can be there as a coach and, and, and help. I mean, your, your comment, though, just speaks of sometimes the magnitude of the challenge. Because your, earlier we heard place things like Wells Fargo, the board should actually be concerned about the culture of the whole company. And yes. yet, as you say, even for the board to manage its own culture, um, can be challenging. Yes, so and I think the key word area. Mm. the key word is not uh, best practice, rule out best practice. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just good practice. That's already, you know, there's bad, Wells Barco is bad practice. <laughs> you know, let's have a good practice. Let's not have best practice. If I may respond to I think please. corporate governance can help you in your example. I'm sorry I'm using our example, but this is a culture I know. You know about the gift issue. We made a rule in Mamtelaka. Yeah. If I am meeting a head of a state or my investment manager seeing somebody lower, it's the same gift. Standard corporate governance gift. It's a book about Mahre. Everybody gives the same thing. So you don't feel ashamed that this, he's a ruler, I have to give him something more expensive, or he's a lower. You standard those things, and then everybody applying the same thing. And believe me, everybody below you would be very happy about implementing because you are doing the same thing. We have the same thing. We don't have great things. <laughs> uh, I'm not disagreeing on, yeah. on in terms of how you structure. But let's say, let's say I'm going to a country, uh, I won't mention a name, uh, but that country is well known for certain mindsets. And I want to get assets in that, mindset, in that country. And I go and give him a gift of a book. Now for me, you give me a book, that means that you think I'm intelligent enough that I want to read. I, I find that very uh, appealing. You give someone a book, the first thing they're going to go is, oh, a nice coffee table book. Yeah, there you go. And, and it's the, uh, you think, when you go, he will think, I am person X. He gave me a book. Yeah. It, it doesn't resonate. Um, I, won't, I won't make business there. 
The real, yeah, the the real, do you really want exactly, to own exactly, assets exactly. in that country? Yeah, yeah, you know, depending, yes, depending, <laughs> depending on the industry it's in. If this, if this country happens to have the only thing I want, a mine which produces certain products which I can't get anywhere else, uh, yes, I have no choice. This is the situation. Right. Do you consider giving him a Ferrari, a bribery or not? <laughs> oh, well, if he's, a, if, he's, if he's an old man, it's a facilitation thing. Yes. <laughs> if, he, if he's a really, he's like he's 80 years old, giving him a Ferrari is a you know, wasted gift. But yes, you know, it looks good, it looks shiny. <laughs> All right, do so we have one or two quick <laughs> questions to end with? Yes, right here, please. So just a, a comment here. I believe ethics is uh, universal if we follow the golden rule. The golden rule is don't do anything to others what you don't like others to do to you. Yeah. Ethics is universal, culture is different. Ethics is about responsibility, truthness, fairness, and justice. And if we follow that, this is universal. So I don't think that's uh, different from culture to culture. Thank Very you. Good. Very good. Let's, uh, one more, and is there another question for the, or comment for the panel? Yes, in the back here. There's a gentleman there. You're going to make a run of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Exercise is good. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, this is Abad Ahmed from Sharika Bitramin, Saudi Arabia. Um, my question is, do you see the region becoming more market driven in the near future? And, and a linked question is, do family businesses uh, fear that culture and values might change if the region becomes more market driven? Oh. Oh, it's the next panel. But Anyone want to respond to either of uh, the extent to which governance can be built on more universal ethics and values or uh, just the trends around market focus in the region? I think it has to be universal. To me, I go back to my example. If you have a machine, it should be the same operating manual. It should not change from country to country. I know iPhones don't have a telephone, don't have a manual, but we get used to when you buy something, there's, the, the language could change, but the instruction should be the same. It has to be universal. That should be a good way of doing business. All right. uh, I think the world is becoming a small village. So we're going to have a common culture eventually. And we, 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 we're migrating there. And there has to be a right balance between market and, uh, and so, you know, societal. There's always critiques in the US. There's always critiques in the, in the UK. There's always, you know, so, and that, that balance is always sometimes changes from here to there. But it's really society determines that. All right. Actually, I think we should, we should start wrapping up. So let me give you one final question. If, if you could make one major change happen in this space, um, in terms of practice or regulation or anything, um, what could be for the world, could be for the region, um, your choice, um, what, what kind of major change would, would you really like to see out there? That's such a lovely question. Right. <laughs> and yet so dangerous. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, my personal wish would be anyone who would take up the mantleship of leading a company should go through an educational process prior to. And when I say an educational process, I don't mean what you call a small you know, uh, five-day course. No, no, no. But a proper course on understanding what he or she is embarking upon. Because they are taking other people's lives and they will be affecting other people's lives. And most people don't think of that. The first thing they think about is how much money am I going to make and how big is my house and car and Ferrari. Uh, and I'd like them to think about a holistic view because it's not just my life I'll be affecting, but everybody else's life. And that means taking an education. And when I mean education, I don't mean just numbers and cents and dollars. No, no. I'm talking a holistic view. If you can do that, then the chances of you having good ethics, good morality, irrespective of where you are, um, good choice on people who come on board, the ability to have an open ear, that's fantastic, and I think everyone else will benefit from it. Yeah. Very nice. We have many of our executive MBAs in the, the audience, so a nice wish for, for them. Someone else with a, a major change you'd like to see happen? I think it's a, it's a number of things, but it all evolves around education, you know, around good practice, around best practice, and it, uh, so, uh, and benchmarking is, is always useful, uh, you know, it helps people, you know, determine 
you know, what choice, what choices do they have and how would they like to, to you know, uh, improve their, uh, their government system or their ethics or their cultural system and, and the way they do business. Uh, so it's really, I think, communication, better communicating the values. I agree with Michelle that education is very important, but for me, I think we need to push the frontier of corporate governance because I believe that's a continuity to the family businesses. I think a lot of the Gulf countries, family businesses have started, they are first generation, maybe they go to second generation. We don't want them to fail. And usually you find that when it goes to third generation, it starts failing. If the government or you know, regulator can really push that to private and family businesses, they are really giving them a longer life to stay. Because then brothers are not being fueled and business disappear. It will continue properly. This idea that the entrepreneurs, it's great, but if you're going to sustain the success, as you were saying, that's where governance is going to become critical. Right. And we have and a living example region here. in particular. We yeah. have a living example here, the Kano Group. They're more than 100 years old. Yeah, not me, huh? Yeah. Well, we are. Yeah, I'm not 100 yeah. years old. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Pekka, um, what would your, your wish be? Uh, yeah, I, I believe that why we have had problems with the boards, uh, especially in Europe and Asia in the past with this eight-year example, ten-year example of the underperforming company, I, I believe I have, I have heard people mention it, the fear factor. I would add uh, in Europe the old boys network. Uh, that's why we had had two comfortable boards and uh, my wish would be uh, to have uh, obviously ethical people but especially strong people so that the board members uh, are not uh, afraid of CEO and are not, certainly not afraid of each other. I have seen it in a couple of boards where I have been big difference people uh, between the board members when we get the strong people who, who uh, are willing to speak their mind when they see something going wrong. Very good. Thank you. Ludo, we started with you. Do you have a, a few last thoughts? What would, you're deep in this area, but do you ha can you boil down to, to well, one I wish I, for I practice? Would, I would say uh, taking more responsibility. I want more directors to uh, take responsibility, resign, and say, look, I'm not up to the task, and it's my fault. I, was, I contributed to this, and I find there's too much about boards just disappearing or just pointing to the CEO. But there's always the other question, which is if the CEO didn't, is suddenly so bad, and this is an unfair practice, the, the light is on green, and suddenly there's another discussion, which envelope do you choose, you know, which is uh, uh, the money or you fight? And um, I, I would sort of say that uh, more responsibility by board members, uh, assuming in the question of are we adding value, and this would be the comment on, on the entrepreneur, it's your comment, which is, if you're an owner, or if you're a CEO, or if you're a stakeholder, put pressure on the board and say, you know, how do you add value? And, uh, and if not, you know, uh, go back to school or go into the desert, you know, think about it and come back in better shape. So I want more responsibility and, and more turnover uh, among board members. All right. Thank you. This is a uh, challenging topic. I think just to echo Ludo, um, it's important that we build understanding so that people are putting pressure on boards, that they understand the importance that they contribute to good or bad practice. So thank you to each of you for helping to shed light on this complex topic. Thank you. Thank you.